There are so many top 10 and top 100 greatest film lists out there, but there's perhaps no list more prestigious than the one the British Film Institute's Sight & Sound magazine publishes every decade. They pull hundreds of film critics and directors for two epic lists. It is the largest professional poll of its kind. Every critic and director voting has their own strategy and thought process behind their votes. But regardless of the person, voting in this kind of poll isn't exactly the same thing as just listing out your 10 favorite movies. What would you vote for if you had the chance to participate in the poll? Would you just go with your top 10 favorites or would you try to list out the 10 films you think are technically the best made? Comment below with your picks and then watch the rest of the video and see if you change them. In order to unpack how these kinds of polls work and why critics vote for what they do, including voting for some movies that may seem out of left field, we're going to follow the thought process of a hypothetical film critic. Let's call him Jim Bean, as he creates his list for the Sight and Sound poll. Join me and Mr. Bean as we overthink and overanalyze how to vote in the Sight and Sound's greatest films of all time list. Here are Jimmy's 10 favorite movies. It's a good balance between movies any self-respecting critic should enjoy, like Citizen Kane, and movies that bring him personal joy, like Night is Short, Walk on Girl. But if you were to ask him to come up with the 10 best movies of all time, his enjoyment aside, he might come up with a list like this. It's filled with plenty of fairly standard takes, and in general, it follows the perceived consensus of greatness, whatever that means. These two lists are not the same, and sure he could just submit the second one and be done with it, but that seems a little underwhelming, a little too impersonal. He asks himself a critical question. If he votes for a movie that he's passionate about, but isn't part of the usual slate of films on the list, and therefore not likely to make it into the top 100, is that a wasted vote? How do you make your 10 votes count? After all, there were more than 600 movies voted for in 2012, and only 100 made it. Why vote for Francois Truffaut's The Bride Who Wore Black if it doesn't stand a chance? How do you balance choosing movies that are obviously great with movies that you think need more appreciation? This leads us to the first important point of voting in this type of list. The prompt asks for what you think are the 10 greatest films of all time, but in reality, you're not voting on the top 10. You're choosing your picks for the top 100 with your 10 votes. If this list was constrained to only 10 entries, there'd be little point in voting for new movies with little critical consensus behind them. Unless you're trying to maximize the likelihood of voting for all 10 movies that make it into the top 10, there's plenty of room for adventure and unconventional picks. A list like this tends to have a life of its own because there is something of a critical consensus that manifests in every version. We can examine previous iterations to make fairly accurate guesses about a film's placement on the upcoming list. Knowing where a film might be placed is critical to being able to determine if you think it's worth voting for or not. If a certain movie is more than likely to be on the list, you can make an informed choice to vote for it and push it up, or save the vote and spend it elsewhere. Bean considers the 2012 list. They're the obvious frontrunners that are all but guaranteed to do well. Then there are some surprises. Movies like Casablanca and Lawrence of Arabia, long considered classics, but are below 80 on the list. Both of which are in the top 10 on the AFI's 2009 list and place high on other lists. He then considers how many people voted for each film. Large margins separate the top three from each other. Vertigo got 191 votes, 34 more than Citizen Kane. But it's pretty quick before you get to differences of eight or fewer. Sunrise and 2001 are only separated by three votes. A single vote might count in a race like that. Mr. Bean also considers all of the regular cinema goers he writes his reviews for. Now, they've probably never heard of a movie like A Day in the Country or The Spirit of the Beehive. He takes a look at his two lists, which are as good a place to start as any. Citizen Kane and Vertigo are practically guaranteed to top the poll this year, or at least get in the top 10. He's a fan of both and doesn't really care which one is top dog. So he reasons that for him personally, a vote for either could be better used elsewhere. Night of Short Walk On Girl and Suspiria are both two of his favorite movies and are accomplished films in their own right, but are likely to get a big fat zero between the two of them. And he's not passionate enough to be a defender of them, so they get kicked. Only three movies from the 2000s made it onto the 2012 critics list, so any movie released after 2010 needs to be considered carefully. Therefore, Bean disregards Incendies. Contrary to this though, Yi Yi was on the 2002 list barely two years after its release in 2000. These aren't so much rules as they are guidelines. At this point, there are five left. Breathless is wildly influential and you can't in good conscience not vote for it, plus his vote might very well push it up or down a spot. Blade Runner and The Wild Bunch, both classics of their respective genres, were both on the 2012 list. Bean decides to just keep Blade Runner as he'd like to save the other vote for another film. These two votes are safe bets, consistent with the idea that he's voting for movies that are statistically likely to be on the list, but not so likely that his vote won't make a difference in a film's place on the list. Essentially ask yourself, of the movies likely to be on the list, which ones do you want to do better, and which ones do you not care as much about their placement? 
The list would be pretty boring if it only included movies that were previously featured on the 2012 version. So it's important to reevaluate our standards of greatness and make room for new arrivals. But of course, that leaves you open to greater chances of voting for something that doesn't get anywhere near the top 100. So here we encounter the third principle of voting on this list. Movies that get seen and get discussed get voted on. Over the past two decades, Martin Scorsese has loudly been singing the praises of Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, and their films have risen in the ranks on the list during that time. The first factor here is restorations and re-releases. Our critic remembers seeing a beautiful restoration of the classic film The Red Shoes early in the 2010s. It's a film that didn't get a proper restoration until the late 2000s, and therefore didn't really have enough steam to get on the top 100 in the last list. Martin Scorsese is a huge fan, and Bean happens to agree with him about the movie. It's a real triumph of filmmaking that deserves to be celebrated along with its restoration. The second factor here is critical discussion. It's been a decade since the last Sight and Sound poll, and we can consider the critical discourse and other polls of critics and filmmakers conducted in the intervening years. Bean Boy decides No Country for Old Men from his favorites list gets to stay because he considers it one of the best made in the 21st century. It's aged enough to become something of a modern classic, and it got 10th in the BBC's 100 Greatest Films of the 21st Century poll. Therefore, he can be assured that he's not the only one still thinking about it. The third factor of visibility is availability. If only a few critics are able to watch a movie, it's more likely to only get a few votes. Movies that have recently been restored and re-released, as well as movies recently published for the first time on home media, are likely to be discussed and on everyone's mind, and therefore more likely to get votes. Jim recently purchased a brand new Blu-ray release from the Criterion Collection of Memories of Murder, a film that he's been hearing a lot of praise about in various critical circles. And Bong Joon-ho just got a lot of attention for Parasite. Pong. Memories would be a perfect film to try and get on the list this year. He reasons that maybe all the renewed dialogue surrounding the film and filmmaker will provide it the momentum needed to get the votes to matter. What kinds of conversations are critics and the wider public having? We're currently expanding our concept of the normal film canon, and there's an increased appetite for underheard voices in cinema. The fourth thing to consider when voting is variety. It would be odd to vote for 10 black and white movies, just as it would be odd to vote for 10 noir films or 10 Alfred Hitchcock pictures. It's good to have a range of artistic voices and kinds of films on your list. This isn't so much a principle of strategic voting as it is a good guide to voting for a meaningful group of movies that capture a wide range of human expression and stories. Of course, it can be a way of strategic voting too. A film like Moonlight is very likely to make at least the top 200, if not the top 100. It fulfills the need for a unique directorial voice like Barry Jenkins, and it deals with topical social issues. It's a film that is very much part of the contemporary social conversations we're having, so it's likely to be on a lot of critics' minds. So far, Mr. Bean's list is mostly dominated by American movies, so he needs to change that. Andrei Tarkovsky is one of the all-time great directors, and his film Stalker is an absolute banger. As is In the Mood for Love, which did surprisingly well on the 2012 list, and he'd like to see it go a little higher if possible. 42 critics voted for it, tied with Ordet and Rashomon, both of which he doesn't think are quite as good, so his vote would most certainly count if it repeats that level of success. All of these movies so far are good, but they're fairly standard narrative features. Bean wants to add a film that expands the idea of filmmaking on a narrative and technical level. Man with a Movie Camera is a film he considers one of the greatest, but he thinks there's another film that is more deserving of his vote. These days, video essays are increasingly dominant in artistic discourse, and he can't help but think it's high time for F for Fake to get its time in the sun as a groundbreaking essay film by one of the greatest filmmakers. It got seven votes in the 2012 list, so it's not entirely out of left field, but it's an underdog for sure, and an underdog he can get behind for the sake of the art form. For this last pick, our critic decides to just pick one for himself. The last voting guideline here is the good old personal preference. Sometimes you just have to go with your heart, and if it gets on the list or not is of no importance. The last film Bean has on his favorite films list is Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye. As a lover of the noir genre, this film is a real diamond in the rough. It's also directed by one of the greatest American directors, Robert Altman, so it's not a completely crazy pick. Bean locks it in and finishes his list. Here are the 10 movies Mr. Bean is voting for. Are they his favorites, or simply a list of the ones he thinks are the best? Not necessarily, but what it is is a list of 10 movies he'd like to see on the top 100 for various reasons. It's a good mix between classics and newcomers, genres and directors, and filmmaking styles from diverse origins. And so our critic votes, and waits, like the rest of us. Each critic votes in their own way, but we can see these considerations play out to a greater or lesser extent with many voters. 
Roger Ebert plays it mostly safe and conventional. But he includes a new movie like The Tree of Life, which has been discussed quite a bit and has made appearances on Best of the 2000s lists. And Aguirre, The Wrath of God, a film which is not usually in the greatest of all time discussion, but is one that has a unique director, it's from a country that's not represented elsewhere on his top 10, and has a wildly fascinating story behind it. It was also released on DVD in the previous decade. Guardian critic Peter Bradshaw has what I'd consider a classic strategic voter list, including a selection of American classics, visually audacious films, movies from around the world, an assortment of great directors, and a few unexpected and probably personal picks. It's a really adventurous list, one that probably doesn't seek to pick the 10 greatest films ever made, but rather 10 films deserving of recognition in a wider 100 film list that spans the breadth and depth of the cinematic medium. Our fake film critic, Mr. Bean, represents a summation of a lot of different ways you could approach voting on this list. I'm not necessarily advocating for doing a ton of research or using every single reason I mentioned to rationalize a vote, but rather these are some of the potential ways of narrowing down your list to 10. The new Sight & Sound list is going to come out sometime this fall, and what 10 films would you vote for, and why? Did this video change how you'd go about choosing your 10? Do you want more content about cinema and the Sight & Sound list? I host the Split Take Cinema podcast with my buddy Chandler, and in each episode we discuss a movie from the 2012 BFI list. We're only halfway through, so we'll be continuing with that list for some time, but I'll definitely be producing more content like this about the upcoming 2022 list, including a predictions video. Like and sub for more great film discussion content, and thanks for watching.